I find it ironic that we're talking about Sabbath this week on one where not just me, but talking with Sherry and others, everyone seems to be bit, very busy and, and having their energies called from them in many different directions. So I think this is a very, very fitting topic to talk about. And we'll just dive right in to uh, chapter nine, the recovering self, Exodus 31, uh, verse 19. At the beginning of the chapter, Brigham notes how there are seven chapters given by God in the writings between Exodus 25, verse 1 through 31, verse 17. Each speech is introduced with the phrase, the Lord said to Moses. That's how you know you're entering into another uh, of these seven speeches or instructions from God. And of this, Brigham writes, the sum of the seven speeches has suggested to many interpreters that these speeches are intended to be a counterpoint to the seven days of creation in Genesis, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 4, the first part of verse 4. And he, no, I emphasize when he said suggested to many interpreters no. there, many interpreters, and also a suggestion. That this is by no means nailed down. And I went back and I compared the seven speeches with the seven days of creation, and I, I read a few articles about why what the what the um, similarities are between those and i felt that i i wasn't necessarily turned off or convinced um but today's pivotal text found in the seventh speech um definitely correlates because it explicitly says that it reads it is a sign forever it um being the sabbath is a sign forever between me and the people of israel that in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and refreshed. That last word refreshed will become very important as we move forward. Uh, as I alluded to, some scholars question as to whether these speeches really do correlate with the seven days of creation. But in these verses, there is a direct reference to the seventh day. There we read how on the other six days, God performs and generates. But on the seventh day, God does not perform or produce, but rests. By keeping the Sabbath, Israel was to model this behavior, model God's behavior. God, in modeling Sabbath, taught us, teaches us something about God's nature. In fact, Brueggemann will try to make the case that God is not God's full self without Sabbath rest. More on this in a moment. But Sabbath was important for the people and was instructive to the people for many reasons. And there are three listed by the author. It served, one, as a sign or a reminder that, th that we are more than productivity in, in labor. Two, it served as a time, a space in time when the sacred and the holy are more apparent. It's similar today when we set aside a Sunday for worship. It reminds us that there are, um, it, it gives focus, it gives focus to um, the, the, the presence of God and, and, the, and the presence of the holy. Or to quote Brueggemann, it is a time of thick engagement with God that contrasts with other times that are less intensely God-pointed times, the other times being less intensely God-pointed times, contrasting going with church with taking out the trash, sort of. The, and Israel, in its observance of Sabbath as a work stoppage, acknowledges right in its midst the intensity of God in its life. And then third, the Sabbath was a perpetual covenant. Um, season by season, year by year, the seventh day of the week would remind the Israelites that they were God's people and Yahweh was their God and that this would not change over the course of time. So emphasis on perpetual, the, the God's going with the people, being with the people, striving with the people in perpe perpetuity being the point and the Sabbath being a, a timeless institution that should carry on forever, according to the instructions reminds them that, that God is all with them in the same way. The crux of today's chapter is the idea that without Sabbath rest, we cannot be our full selves. In fact, God will not be God's full self without Sabbath. So we, being made in God's image, must Sabbath to find our full identity. It is said in the text that by resting on the Sabbath, God is refreshed. The word translated refreshed in our text is from the Hebrew nefesh. Brueggemann spends some time explaining how the obscure Hebrew word nefesh functions, used three other times in the Hebrew Bible. It's used to describe God's rest in Genesis chapter 3, verse 2, and is again used here in today's pivotal text. 
in Exodus 31, verse 17. On the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. What is lost in translation is that this word means something more than refreshed in the sense that we most often mean it. For example, they were refreshed by a glass of cool water. There's more to this word than that. Quoting Brueggemann, again, an extended quote. What astonishes is that the translation refreshed is quite weak and misleading. The verb used here means person, that is to be personed or repersoned. I was trying to think of my own, as an aside, sorry, stepping away from the quote. I was trying to think of my own way of explaining to myself what I think this means. And I would say, like, when you say somebody came to themselves or wasn't themselves without this thing, I even thought of that Snickers commercial where somebody is like out of sorts and, and behaving, you know, they, they're they even portrayed in a way that doesn't look like them until they grab the Snickers and then they're them full selves. And it's like, why wait, grab a Snickers? That's the kind of the idea that there's something lost or reduced in the person until they have been rejuvenated in this sense. Um, the verb might be rendered as a passive, going back to the quote, as a passive was refreshed or as a reflexive refreshed oneself. Either way, it is more than refreshed as we know the word. From the noun nefesh, the verb refers to the full restoration and recovery of the self that had been depleted and diminished by too much work or too much fear or too much energy in flight. Taken as a statement about God in our text, it suggests that God rests on the Sabbath day because God's own self has been depleted and diminished by too much work in creation. Even God in priestly horizon, meaning in the priestly tradition reflected in the Torah, is seen to be lessened, to be weak. God must recover the true self of God by Sabbath rest. That is, God has worn out was worn out after six days of creation, but now with Sabbath, God is yet again become God's full self. How much more is this true for the human self who is regularly diminished and depleted by too much work? According to Israel's narrative, in Pharaoh's domain, there was never Sabbath rest. The human self, or the Hebrew slave, was so abused and exploited as to lose the self. Indeed, the safe slave system depended upon depleted slave selves who could work productively but who had not enough self to assert freedom for justice. Thus, Sabbath rest or recovery of the nefesh is a covenantal contradiction to the exploitative system of Pharaoh. The human self participates in the same recovery program of Sabbath as does God. The human self is like God in, sorry, I gotta move this thing, in depletion. The human self, moreover, is like God in the recovery of the self through Sabbath rest. So if God needs Sabbath rest to be complete, if Sabbath is integral to the nature of God's very being, then it follows that we, children of God that we are, need to frequently be nefeshed, refreshed, repersoned by Sabbath rest. Otherwise, we lose ourselves. I would argue that humans are so often preoccupied with productivity that we often do lose ourselves and our humanity. Or to quote old Walt, meaning Walt Brueggemann. Um, if we transport this Sabbath possibility into our own context of 24-7 multitasking in an economy of scarcity that accumulates in an unwinnable rat race, it is clear that the dominant values of the market economy invariably deplete the human self through exploitative production, coercive shopping, and mindless entertainment, all of which amount to endless consumerism. More than that, it is credible to imagine that the ideology of the market intends and wants people de-selved. Such depleted selves lack the sense of self that makes sustained critical reflection possible, that may produce subversive action, and that is capable of entertaining alternatives to the dominant production system. Regimented slaves who carelessly or indifferently accept the production schedules of Pharaoh are easy to administer and will readily assent to the pyramid schemes of Pharaoh for the benefit of those who administer the program. Thus, the term usually translated refresh is in fact a revolutionary social practice. It is a refusal to accept diminishment and a practical resolve to recover the self as an active engaged agent in the economy and in the public life of the world. Next class will be September 1st, chapter 10, and let's uh, bring it back. Thoughts or comments or reflections? I 
I liked, I liked the use of repersoned. I just, I kind of identified with that, you know, how you can feel so out of sorts with yourself. And then when you have time to just sit back and reflect and get away from whatever it was. And it's like, you're, like you said, like you're finding yourself. That's how I feel when I'm overwhelmed and mm -hmm. I don't, and, and I lose the ability when that end piece is crucial. Like you lose the ability to think critically mm -hmm. and likening that to the Israelites inability to think about, think freely about mm -hmm. their liberation because they were so overworked. So well, I found the most intriguing and I have to spend more time sitting with this idea because it was honestly a new idea to me. At least I don't remember ever thinking about it. Um, that Sabbath rest is integral to God's nature. Now, God doesn't get weakened because God rests. We see it in creation. God is never diminished because God rests. But God, something about the nature of, of life in creation and the life that comes from God that requires the pause and the taking in and the replenishment, the repersoning. And Brueggemann is, because they use the same Hebrew word to describe God in that moment as to describing what we get from Sabbath rest. Um, I, I, something about it being baked into the fabric of existence as God has created it, that all things need this, that if there is not a night and the flowers close and the animals rest in the night or the day, or if we don't find the time, um, we lose ourselves. And why are things this way? Because the one who created it all has put these patterns and rhythms into place because they come from God's very nature as one who also rests for refreshment on the seventh day. That was a new idea to me. Yes, it was a new idea. I never, never heard of God resting. In fact, I hear that he, he does not grow weary. I mean, Isaiah, something there, says there are God both. does not get weary. There are and both. There are both. They're both. Okay. They're both reflected. And there's two. We've talked about different opinions about God being reflected sometimes. And this is one instance where you have a God that rests or walks through the garden. Or next week, we'll talk about a God that maybe listens to input and changes God's mind. You know, think yeah. the story of Lot, where, oh, yeah. you know, you've got that. And then you've got another belief that seems opposed to this idea that God is sovereign over all, immovable, unchangeable, inflexible. And theologians have, in, over the course, not in modern times, but in, over the course of centuries, have acknowledged these two diff, seemingly different God images and have synthesized them in this way, by saying that God does not change in any of the ways that are integral to God's character in nature. God is all loving. God has all of the power. God is sovereign and over all. But in the ways that don't compromise God's nature, God moves, God adjusts, God works with yeah. creation. Um, and as, as, like I said, I mentioned the story of Lot. Yeah, he um, got very angry with Israel over and over and over again. And when they repented, he forgave them. Yeah. I guess, it, you, I guess my thought is that in that part of the story, the familiar part, in the seventh day and God rested, I thought it as being as like a artist, yes, or even, even a a person of that has written music or something like that. That you you sit back and you look at it and you evaluate it and and you um, see if there's something you want to change or something. And that's when when I've always heard that before. And then the seventh day that God rested it. That's the way I've always taken it is that God's looking at what he's done to maybe have to do some more or something, you know, so. I've thought of it similarly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, but here's where my mind is going. And I'm thinking along with you here, when you do appreciate art, you really only have space in your life to appreciate the beauty around you. When you take the moment to disengage from productivity to see it and that in and of itself replenishes and nourishes us i think this is this is not just about getting a nap or making sure you've got your eight hours 
you know, or, or making sure that you refrain from physical activity I, I, I true rest that actually recharges us, um, is more than stasis and sitting still. Um, I've, you've spent days like that where you did nothing around the house and sometimes it's necessary, but sometimes I find myself feeling worse after a day like that. Um, I don't know. I have to spend some more time thinking about this idea. And I also want to spend more time looking at that word nefesh that I had never, I had never really it's done that. Word. It's yeah. a new, new word. word. And, yeah. and, um, I also want to spend more time with the idea that this, these seven speeches, I want to decide for myself if they really are seven different speeches. And then I want to decide if there really is an intentional correlation between those seven commands or speeches and the seven days of creation. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to spend on looking at that, but what I saw was kind of like, um, yeah, I guess if you squint and look at it that way, kind of there's, you know, and then, and then other things I read, I just didn't what very convincing. So I don't know. Is it just possible that uh, seven days, seven speeches, <laughs> you know, seven, seven, sevens throughout the Bible, 40 seven, throughout the Bible, 12 seven, throughout the Bible. They're just God's numbers. Yeah. And, and, and I guess it doesn't really matter too much for our discussion today, because this one definitely is about the, the seventh the sabbath the, the seventh day is specifically cited but yeah. so it is ironic that we have this sabbath reminder on a week where we are all running so busy um i'm going to try to remember it better n- early next week when i have the time and the space to actually do something about it this week i didn't i don't have the time to really put into practice the the idea of replenishing when the end of that, he tied it directly to labor. And I, I, when I worked at the corn mill and different times working even as pastor, but I know many people who are working your, your standard nine to five jobs, either in production lines or some other office work. And um, if you've ever been close to or had a, a spouse or a friend who has sort of lost themselves for a period of time in, in their work for being exhausted, it's true. We mm-hmm. do need to be reselled if we've been worn so thin mm-hmm. through the rest. Mm-hmm. Kelly says that even though I made more money working at the corn mill than I did when I went to go pastor the, my church, I was at the last 10 years. Um, just the, the change in my mood mm-hmm. for having more space in my life to rest was well, she mm-hmm. says it, it wasn't worth the money for you because I was angry. I was mean. Um, I was, I was irritable and I would pretend it wasn't about me being tired. You know, Mm -hmm. I would pretend that I had a right to be this angry and to speak that way to Mm -hmm. Kelly and to people around me. Um, I remember, go ahead. I used to hear a lot of people's, you know, talk about teachers and having the summer off. And I eventually came to the realization and I would say it if we didn't have that time off you wouldn't have as many teachers <laughs> my dad was a teacher uh-huh. Uh-huh. I can testify to that and it makes you wonder about other vocations where oh absolutely never assumed mm-hmm. that yeah. mm. the ones that require extra hours I know my daughter went through that with the work-life balance um, in the job that she was in and you know she was offered another position where she was assured there would be work-life balance. And before she actually got into it, the whole tone of conversation changed. And she knew that wasn't, that wasn't going to work for her because there wasn't going to be any work-life balance. Yeah. Well, I was just going to mention uh, that since we were talking about the Bloms earlier, that one of the things Margaret has uh, mentioned several times in the circle was that um, and those stories about Jesus and his ministry that he would be be preaching to a big crowd and then he'd go across the lake or something and he would uh, be off by himself for a while mm-hmm. <laughs> you know and that there, this happened 
you know, repeatedly, although I don't have those scriptures in front of me, but I think that's right. You know, and that, that was like a lesson for us. It's, that, it's true. That's where those boat stories often come into play where he's, why are you sleeping at the boat? It's because he has chosen to recuse himself and, um, and go away to rip mm-hmm. to that's um and that's god incarnate showing us how to be human right. have we ever wondered what it would be like to go back to the days when everything <laughs> was closed on sunday i have <laughs> i've wondered about it and i've wondered why you know why it was so imperative that we that we have everything open on Sunday. I mean, like you can't plan ahead. You have to. It's, I think, opportunities for businesses to make more money. It's the the commercial part of what we read. It's a commercial part of what we read, the commerciality of it. But, But the part I see, if we had that day, it would make maybe more people aware of what the Sabbath was, you know? I, I mean, people that don't go to church, you know, Sunday's just any other day. Mm-hmm. Mostly it's catching up on laundry and, you know, that didn't get done because they worked during the week. But I find myself, particularly with Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A, really admiring them for what mm-hmm. they do. And at the same time, I like Chick-fil-A and it's on the way home and I wish they uh, open on uh, Sunday. <laughs> we've all been there. I've, I've been there. I've driven there on Sundays before. Uh-huh. I am with you. But I also admire I also admire that because it's mm-hmm. it's a it shows a um it's a Christian ver it's a yeah. Christian and Jewish virtue mm-hmm. value that they are showing that we don't live for work. We work mm-hmm. so that we can live. And what good is life if you can't pause, refresh, and enjoy it? Mm-hmm. And um, it doesn't make economic sense, but um, and it makes sense as far if your objective is human well-being. And we don't need we don't need chicken sandwiches at that time for at precisely that moment. And mm-hmm. I you, I just choose not to to shop or go or do anything on Sunday. Um, I decided that a long time ago and a friend wanted me to go with her on Sunday and I, okay, but I felt the friend needed, needed me to go. So, so I went, but what I discovered was when I would do something on Sunday before I made this, decision, it just seems like it, it was a waste of time. I, I never found what I wanted or <laughs> it, it didn't work out right. And so, no, we, we basically, I don't do anything on Sunday. I cook John's breakfast and that's it. What you, what you did, that's, that's that the spirit of love, the law of love is what undergirds all love, all, all, all laws. And so we make rules for ourselves that sometimes we mm-hmm. feel necessary to break in the name of love for another. And I love that. That's, that's, that's very mm-hmm. scriptural too. Paul talked about um, meat sacrifice to idols and things like that, where, you know, there, or and other things where people, um, for the sake of other other folks, make make changes or, or, or acquiesce to to demands in the community out of love, and that. Oh, like that Jesus healing on the Sabbath, for instance. Mm-hmm. That, exactly. Wow, or that. Yeah. yeah. Speaking mm-hmm. of Sabbath, all tied up in. Yeah, the mm-hmm. hospitals have to be open, and yeah. our fire people have to work, and our officers and police have to work mm-hmm. and so yeah there, there's there are sometimes you know <clears throat> people have to do that but yep. you have to choose for yourself what bothered me so much was the sports mm-hmm. the the youth teams yeah. You know, on Sunday afternoon, we would try to make it, but then it got so they were doing it on Sunday morning, you know, and um, that really bothered me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those are the decisions mm-hmm. that we're trying to navigate because we're beholden to the schedule set up by these sports teams. And my kids have one childhood and you remember mm-hmm. what it was like to be involved mm-hmm. and you've got, and, and you're so, I'm so grateful for my parents signing me up for soft, not soft baseball and and all of the things I did and there wasn't, there weren't any Sunday events or if there were, I don't remember any, I don't recall a single one. Um, But 
we haven't had that conflict rise up yet, but um, Jared and Amy Trulinger in our church, they do, they are off. The reason they were so absent this summer was because of softball leagues. And they told me that up front that we would see them very much often until the fall. And sure enough, that's what's, that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. I don't judge people no, I- for that because it's tough. I mean, I, I spoke yesterday with somebody who, um, well, I, I spoke with Jeremy Copley, who washes windows. And when there's clear, when there's clean, when there's good weather and they've been behind, mm-hmm. um, they feel like they have no choice but to go in to clean the windows. And I told him that that reminds me of the farmers that I used to pastor who on a day where the ground was dry, mm-hmm. they needed to, they had to be in the field because if they missed those opportunities, and that's, you know, that's again, why this, the, the spirit of the law is more important than the letter of the law. And we, um, you know, try to meet people where they are, but this is the, another thing I've talked about why it's important. We cannot keep Sabbath the way I think it could be kept unless we all as a culture make this shift. Yeah. Oh. Doing no, it by yourself. That's not going to happen. <laughs> not anytime soon. I don't see how it will. <laughs> And because you can make decisions like you've d- made for yourself, Sue, mm-hmm. which I admire and respect. And, and um, but at the end of the day, it's going to take um, an all of us sort of shift just the way it used to be, I suppose, the way everybody seemed to know that Sunday would be the day off. But or we go out to eat on Sunday and that makes somebody else have to work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's also this trend towards remote work you know so actually if you're working remotely there's really no no hour of the day that you're you know not getting you know work assignments and people contacting you and so on so it's pretty much now Mm. you know 24 7 work and then that seems to be the direction it's going and a lot of people seem to like that I did not particularly like it, but, you know, there's, that's really the whole culture, you know, um, going that direction. It, it, it'll become important for us to learn how to put up boundaries. Um, I yeah. was just, it's funny you bring that up. I was just talking to Sherry about this very thing um, as it relates to work email, where both of us have had on our phones, this thing to where when we get a work email, it'll notify us no matter where we are at any time. And um maybe about a year and a half, two years ago, I set it to where I had to check my work email to know what was happening. It wasn't going to come and get me. I had to engage it, which I do on a daily basis. But when I choose to have six hours with my kids by the canal or at a ball game or something, mm-hmm. I don't look at it. And I, the reason Sherry and I were talking about that was she was telling me, you know, how when she's at home, basically what you said, what you were, um, what you were, Um, saying Nancy that it's just always sort of with you or can be a um, this can what is a move for convenience and practicality going online because we can become can become um, an increase to our workload rather than a a help to it Mm -hmm. 